Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Christina. That's certainly a pretty explicit message that we all should be aware of. For a weak moment uh, several months ago, um, I found myself volunteering my services and Veronica's to chaperone 42 Mariner High School students back to New York City where they were invited to be part of a national youth Choir to perform in Carnegie Hall. My oldest daughter happens to teach the choir classes at um, Mariner and several people had backed out so in desperation she asked us to go. Well we were a little apprehensive about being, um, th there were seven chaperones altogether, but we were still a little apprehensive of being about being around the nine teenagers assigned to us, but we didn't really have anything to worry about because they were very good. They were very obedient and respectful. We didn't have any problems with them at all. The concert was on a Sunday night and we were scheduled to leave Monday afternoon. So Monday morning the whole choir and the chaperones visited the National 9-11 Memorial Plaza. Um, I don't know if any of you have visited there. That was our first experience. And of course, when you think of the rubble that surrounded the towers, uh, now there's just a flat uh, plaza uh, with two um, waterfalls going down into the ground 30 feet on either side of the um, places where the towers stood. They don't replicate exactly the size of the towers, but they're in the location. And then around those pools are, uh, there's walls about, oh, I suppose about this high with uh, placards on, I, I don't know if it was marble or not, it was a black stone uh, going all the way around. And for example, in the North Tower, they had all of the people's names who perished not only in the tower, but in the plane that hit the tower. And similarly with the South Tower, the same thing, except they had the names of all of the, um, all of the other planes, the one that hit the Pentagon and the one that uh, went down in Pennsylvania, as well as the names of people that were on the ground surrounding the towers and the first responders, the uh, policemen in their battalion, the firemen in their ladder company. So, when we stood there looking at it all, it was very, very, uh, very moving experience. And the guides told us before he walked in there to be quiet, not to have, you know, be laughing or joking or, you know, anything like that. And for the most part, everyone was pretty solemn because they could remember back. Um, also in the plaza is what they call the survivor tree. Uh, when they uncovered all the rubble, uh, interestingly enough, there was a tree that had survived and it was only about eight feet tall, what remained of it, with it had one living branch, so they transplanted it, nurtured it, and uh, now there's, you know, big growth coming out all around, but you can see the dark part of where the old, t what was the old tree, and it's held securely by um, cables, but when you think back about what happened, it wasn't hard at all to be standing there and making that contrast as to what happened, you know, 13 years ago now, 12 years ago. Turn to Luke 13, verse 1. Luke 13, verse 1. I'm going to be reading from the NLT, not only this scripture, but for the rest of the um, message. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. And he said, do you think those Galileans were the worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? He asked, is that why they suffered? And to put it in a contemporary vein, is that why the people in the World Trade Centers suffered? and died? Is that why the people in Oso, who were sitting in their homes drinking coffee and reading the morning paper, suddenly heard this grinding noise and then found themselves engulfed in this 
huge mudslide or the people going along Highway 530, going from Arlington to Darrington or vice versa were suddenly engulfed with it. Or the flight Malaysian 370, which they still haven't discovered the whereabouts. Or the South Korean ferry Sewol, or anything like that. Were these worse sinners than all the other people? And he answers that in verse 3, not at all. And you will perish also unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And then he goes on and talks about the, the uh, tower in Siloam and said were the people in Jerusalem that suffered this, were they were sinners? And he once again says, no, not at all. Well, that's a pretty stinging indictment and right to the point. Jesus doesn't mince words there, and you can't ignore that very explicit warning. Let's look at another scripture, James 4, verse 13. James 4 and verse 13, where it says, Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town. We're going to Chicago, and we're going to set up a business there. Uh, we're going to stay there a year, and if things look good, we'll expand to Denver and Omaha and uh, maybe St. Louis. We will do business there and make a profit. It says in the following verse, though, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Because your life is like the morning fog. And Veronica and I used to just love to see the morning fog come up uh, across from where we lived out in Monroe, out in a field. It just kind of hung along the ground. She said it reminded her of the moors and these romantic English novels where the fog plays an important part. But it's here today and when, I mean it's here for a little while and the sun comes up and poof, it's gone. Is that how we approach our lives? Can we be like the little boy who was overheard praying, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it because I'm having a real good time just like I am. So, you know, you don't have to be concerned about me. Well, do we think, you know, I'm doing okay, I'm getting by, I haven't had any major problems. And because of this, we tend to harbor a casual or a lax attitude toward our calling. Or conversely, we may be terribly discouraged and not even able to see the light at the end of our respective tunnel. In order to cope with feelings of helplessness, we sometimes adopt a, well, what's the use attitude? Maybe the future at this time may seem so bleak and so foreboding that there doesn't seem to be any way out, any way to solve whatever the problem is. Some of you have probably in the past been out on a small boat uh, on a lake or maybe a river or a canoe even and perhaps had a qual or a squall I should say suddenly just come out of nowhere and pretty soon the wind is buffeting the boat and the waves are higher and you're being tossed up and down and sometimes that's exactly how we feel emotionally. First we're up and we think well maybe there's a glimmer of hope somewhere on the horizon and then you plummet back down into depression because of how helpless everything seems. You know, the hope that God gives us from the biblical examples um, at times like this are able to and can give us the stability we need in our lives, even in the midst of emotional storm. Turn to Proverbs 15 and verse 15. Proverbs 15, verse 15. For the despondent, 
every day brings trouble. If you're down, if you're feeling down, it doesn't seem to make any difference what bit of news comes into your life or what happens in your life. It is just like it's an entrance of trouble. That's the way you feel. Conversely, for the happy heart, life is a continual feast. And they don't even have to have everything happen that is good. They just look at the slightest little thing. Maybe the sunlight will cause them to be happy. There may be certain things that you may not be able to change in your life when it comes to the situation you're currently in. But the one thing that you do have the power to change is how you look at them. You may not be able to change them, but you certainly can look at them in a different manner. You accept what you can't change. If you do that, you will be able to look at everything else in a more realistic manner and may, may possibly even see possibilities where you once before only saw disaster. You know, everyone needs time to lick their wounds, figuratively speaking, but, but at some point we need to set that type of thinking aside. We need to decide to try to get back in there, to get back in the game as it were. You may feel, well maybe, you know, I'm too old or I'm too tired. And you may be physically sick, which of course is a very legitimate limitation. You know, but absent something like that, um, you have to rethink, do I want to just live this way the rest of my life? You may be suffering from the loss of a friend or a relative. And while it is true, you're never going to find the exact replacement and replica, it shouldn't prevent you from at least giving giving the chance of letting someone else in your life, giving it consideration. You know, while there's no one that will be identical, it's impossible, there just may be someone who is pleasant, who is kind, who is generous, and has qualities that could help nourish a real friendship. And a friendship, of course, can lead to other things, but you have to give it a chance. At some point when the time is right, for you at least, you can be open to the idea and perhaps leave some of the gnawing loneliness that, you know, leave it behind. It certainly is possible that God may place someone in your path who could turn out to be a great friend and or a companion to add to your life and be a great help to you. But you have to be open to those possibilities and you have to be engaged in life, not just a nonchalant bystander. And, and I want to qualify what I've just said by saying I'm not promoting um, matchmaking as such, but I'm just saying that don't exclude what's going on around you and don't exclude the chance to maybe, maybe uh, meet someone different, someone new, someone interesting. Turn to Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 6. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 6 where we're told, plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon. In other words, if you've got something in, as this relates to a farmer, that's one of the most important things that he's going to do in any given year because if he doesn't get his seed in on time, then chances are he won't have a crop. And if he won't have a crop, he may be looking at a bankruptcy. He may be 
looking at a foreclosure on his loan. He may look at losing his farm. So look at the important things in your life. Plant your seed in the morning and continually keep busy all afternoon. Don't plant your seed and then take your fishing pole and go fishing just because you got one thing done. Fill up your life with things that are important. And I'm not by any means saying that, well, you should never take a vacation or you should never go fishing or anything like that. But it's just looking at the relative importance of the things in your life and the priority that you need to have when you're addressing each one of them. Plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon, for you don't know if profit will come from one activity or another, or maybe both. And since you don't know, that's why you need to pay attention to what you're doing. One of them may not turn out, but the other one may. So you can't negate the, uh, the importance of what you do. Don't shut down, don't pull back, don't abstain from confronting life, but instead keep your options open and embrace life. When I was a sophomore in college, um, I was in a fraternity the first quarter of my sophomore year, but I decided to move off campus and save some money and I had a motorcycle I could go back and forth very inexpensively. Um, I answered an ad through the student um, office for a couple that had a beautiful home, um, a lot of trees surrounding it, and an old garage at the back of the property that they'd converted into an apartment. And all they wanted in exchange for a person staying there was that they'd help keep up the yard and since there were a lot of trees, there were a lot of leaves to sweep up or, you know, rake up and that type of thing. So they gave us or gave me that opportunity. But one thing that was very interesting about the man, he was talking to me one afternoon with his wife. And they were talking to me about a friend of theirs who had learned he had terminal cancer. And what he did was he immediately made arrangements with his attorney to have all of his property transferred to his wife. Uh, he did all of these things, took care of all that so she wouldn't have to worry about it. But over and above that, and this is the unique thing I remember and have probably will always remember, he introduced his wife to friends of his, people that he'd known in the past, people that were her age or thereabouts, people that he valued, people that he trusted, and people that he thought might possibly be a good father for his children because he was concerned about his children. Um, I doubt if many of us could do that. I mean, I'd have to think awfully long and hard about that type of thing. But it was very interesting how he was concerned enough about his wife and also his two children. So he did that. Unfortunately, I lost contact with this man. I would have been interested uh, to find out what had developed from that. Turn to 1 Peter 5, verse 7. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, where it says, Give, not some, not a select few, but all, A-L-L -L underlined all your worries and cares to God for he cares about you and if that is the case isn't it reasonable to believe that he will if he cares for us he will take care of us as well I think that's just a given turn to Hebrews 12 verse 1 therefore since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, and this is referring to the 11th chapter of Hebrews where all of the deeds were recounted of the, uh, you know, we call that the faith chapter. Um, because 
we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight. You know, sometimes a runner will add leg and ankle weights to improve his strength and agility because when the weights are removed, um, he can run so much faster. So let us strip off every weight that encumbers us, that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And that's one of the reasons that I like this version because the language is very easy to understand. It trips us up, that's exactly what it does. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Do you think the Boston Marathon runners and spectators a year ago who were maimed for life or lost their lives were the biggest sinners of all? Of course not. And I'd say the ones who just ran recently were certainly an inspiration to Boston, if not the nation as well. They were not thwarted from getting back in the race, literally in this case. We all have encountered obstacles and roadblocks in our lives that have discouraged us and maybe perhaps at times have made us reluctant to even think about going on because of our distorted perception of reality as it existed at that particular time. But that in no way negated God's love and his mercy toward us. We should be confident and hopeful that regardless of how topsy-turvy our lives are at this time, he's always there to see us through. You know, Jesus certainly didn't mince words when he talked about the destination of those who willingly turn their backs on him. But the Bible's replete with examples of his mercy to those who turn to him with their whole hearts. So because we have that hope, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us.